Amen. So I just wanted to start in First Thessalonians again, just to have a scripture to get to it. And we understand that all the New Testament actually is preparing a people for the return of Jesus. That's the whole point of the New Covenant, so that God could, could gather for himself a people who would be his people. They would be the bride of Christ. They would be a perfect church, and uh, we would live forever with him. Everything points to the return of Jesus, and that's what we're looking at this for, because the end, of course, for us is when Jesus comes back in this dispensation of time. But just a, again a passage which I enjoy, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, uh, this is Paul speaking, uh, uh, what manner of, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so again, just a beautiful passage of encouragement for God's people. And we're all waiting for his son to come from heaven, who will deliver us from the wrath of God, which is to come. And that wrath is God's anger, if you like, his vengeance upon all those who will not believe and we will gleefully come against his people and have gleefully come against his people, spoil their goods, uh, kill them and make fun of them gleefully because they have no desire to know about God. They have their own life agenda to have. And so all these ones who will just will never believe God will come and his anger and vengeance will come against them. They will all be destroyed and ultimately we will return to this earth and have a thousand years with the Lord, which will be completely perfect. That's where we're kind of heading along to. So up to this time, we have considered some things. We have considered God's week, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the point that I'm wanting us all to get to is that there is a rest at the end of God's week, at the end of the seventh day. Then we have considered the historical week of this earth in thousand year groupings. We have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, and we have 7,000 years in this earth also, which will culminate in a time of rest. So we are heading for the rest. We were saved for the rest. We were saved to spend forever with our God. And part of that is that we will have a thousand years here on this earth with the Lord being the Lord, our God being the God, and we will live a beautiful life with him for a thousand years. I'm emphasizing the fact that it's a time of rest because there are many different ideas about what that time's going to look like. But for me, it's a time of rest. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that rest because we've all worked hard through this period of time. And I'm looking forward to enjoying this earth without a devil in it. And the Lord is the Lord of it. And we're just going to enjoy his company, his creation, and we'll just have a wonderfully productive, joyful time with him for a thousand years. Can't wait. So that's where I'm heading. That's where I'm taking you. And that's where we need to understand what is going to happen as we work into that period of rest, which we believe is culminating in the not too distant future. So. Part of that understanding is a time that Daniel gave us, and he gave us some very clear indications of the, of, of the period of time that we're going to be living in into the end days. And we looked into the book of Daniel, and we noticed that in all of his prophecies, as he prophesied into this end time, there was a fellow who was going to arise out of the political systems of the world, and he would be the Antichrist. And so for us, there is one marker that we're sort of looking for, and that is the rise of the Antichrist. And he will come eventually, and we will know he has come. Uh, some say, is he in the earth already? Yes, he is. Of course he is. Uh, does he even know he's the Antichrist? Well, possibly not. Uh, but he is certainly going to be available. 
and at the appointed time, which we hear right through Daniel, and I think that's an important word for all of us, the appointed time. God's times and seasons are already fixed. He's not going to change any of these things. His times are there. It's for us to get into his time, not for him to get into our time, as some people seem to think. God is waiting for us. No, he's not waiting for us. We need to be getting ready for him. Hallelujah. The appointed times are there. But at the appointed time, this fellow will come and God will anoint him to be the Antichrist, if you like, and he will do his work in the earth. So Daniel speaks of him. And I just want to go to Daniel uh, chapter 9 just to catch again some of those thoughts before we come into this 70th week uh, that Daniel speaks about. In Daniel chapter 9, and of course there are several prophecies through here which give us indications of the kind of things that will be happening. Daniel chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 24, and we're going through to 27. This is the 70 weeks prophecy. And why it's important just to go back for a minute, just to, to clarify and understand the three elements of this particular prophecy. And it gives us an idea of what's going to be happening at the end. So, verse 24, Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks are determined... <coughs> So let's see, what are those 70 weeks to determine? So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish their transgression and to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the Most High. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild the Jew, to, and, and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. The beginning of 26 and after the 62 weeks the Messiah will be cut off but not for himself. And so for me that's one statement and it sort of looks like this, 70 weeks. 70 weeks, God is telling us, he has ordained to bring an end to transgression, sin, iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. So, I am like everybody else trying to work out what does that mean. So, in my mind, that means that brings an end to the way this world is now. The devil is finished. God's wanting to establish his righteous kingdom. Sin is over. And so for me, the end of this matter is the end. 70 weeks is the end. And those 70 weeks are made up of, he tells us, 7 weeks and 62 weeks, which we all can add, even me this week, <laughs> that makes 69 weeks. So what is happening after 69 weeks? So... Seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and even the, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. So the Messiah, we're understanding that at this point, the Messiah is cut off. That is, Jesus goes to the cross, he's cut off, but not for himself. Who is it for? It's for us. And so why does he divide this up into seven weeks and 62 weeks? Remember, it was from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild. So there's some little time frames in here which we just need to catch because where we're heading is the 70th week. Seven, this is week of weeks. So this is 49 years or weeks of years, 49 and 434 uh, years. So it is understood that he broke it up into those two periods because of this reason. From the time of the going forth of the command to the rebuilding of the temple is around 49 years. So that first period, he's just saying that's when the temple of Jerusalem was rebuilt and that was that period of time. 434 years, interestingly, 
remember there was 400 what they call the silent years in other words there was no more prophetic word uh, Nehemiah and one or two others were the last of the prophets that actually spoke as a canon of scripture so we talk of 400 years of silence and then the 34 years of Jesus ministry into the earth 434 years 62 weeks to the Messiah being cut off which is okay we better put it here uh, that's to that point there 30, 34 plus 400 so that's that's interesting so Daniel is speaking of 49 434 which takes us to the cross and to the end of this 69 weeks so happy with that the next part of 26 says like this and the people of the prince who is to come now we we determine the prince who is to come is Satan the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war desolation shall be determined and so there's a period in here which I'm saying is the second part of this there's a period in here where Jerusalem will be under the feet of the Gentiles and the Bible talks about the Gentile age it will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles there will be war and so forth and this war will continue until the desolations are determined until the end of the war desolations are determined and so this will continue on until God determines an outcome and the outcome is the third part here which is then he who is the prince who is to come will confirm a covenant with many for one week and so at the conclusion of this period of time there will be a covenant for one week which we are saying is the 70th week uh, in Daniel's prophecy the 70th week in Daniel's prophecy so how long is this period of time the brother was asking me last week how do we know there's a gap in here well the only way I know there's a gap in here is that this period is finished and this period has not yet begun and within the natural age of the earth we know that from Adam to Abraham Abraham to Christ Christ to the end is another 2,000 years this is the age of the Gentiles before the end of the age and so this 2,000 years fits into this period of time here and then the 70th week will begin so I'm quite comfortable with that Daniel's prophecy talks to us about 70 weeks till the end he gives us 69 70 years will begin with a covenant made with Israel that has not yet started but historically we know we've had 2,000 years of Gentile age since the cross and so we are now living in this period of time in fact right at the very end of it and it would be my view that we are living right on the cusp of the beginning of that 70th week if we understand this this is quite fascinating to know that this 70th week which we are in my view on the cusp of will be the last week of this dispensation of time that's the last week of history in this dispensation of time so that's a seven year period so what I want us to do now is to go into this period here the 70th week period which we are coming into because this is what we are looking for this will have a lot more signs and indicators for us that we can begin to prepare ourselves for the things that are going to happen so 6,000 years, time of rest. 70 years, 69 are done. 2,000 years of the Gentile age and the 70th week is yet to come. Where is the 70th week? The 70th week is the final week 
in this dispensation of time, the final week in these 2,000 years, which we are now in. We're in 2022. So in all manner of thinking, we're in the ballpark of the 70th week coming into existence. So let's look at this 70th week and see if we can then begin to overlay some other information to help us to understand the things that are going to happen. All that's important to know because that's what the Bible has given us and uh, those are the prophetic words that take us to where we are today and now we need to begin to understand what is going to happen. So if we start with the final week, which is this period here, this is the 70th week of Daniel. This is the week that Daniel is telling us there will be a peace treaty in here. There will be seven years. And in the middle of the week, this treaty will be broken. If we were to read that last piece of Daniel, which I didn't do, it's here. But in the middle of the week, this is verse 27. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the abominations, he shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined and is poured out on the desolate. And so he is going to bring an end to the sacrifice now we read that right through Daniel every time the Antichrist turns up he breaks his <coughs> covenant and he makes an end of sacrifice this is the abomination of desolation that Jesus talks about and on the wing of the abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined and is poured out so he will do his thing through this period until God says that's enough God God has an end time. And so the consummation of all things will be there and this fellow is going to do his ministry through there. So let's look at a little bit more detail around these things. It's three and a half years here, obviously, and three and a half years here. Now, the Bible talks, and we read it many times in Daniel, three and a half years is 1260 days. It's also referred to in Revelation as 42 months. It's also referred to uh, as time plus times plus a half a time, which is three and a half years. So all those refer to the same period of time. And it's my conviction, and I'll tell you why, that that all is referring to this period of, of time after the Antichrist has revealed himself to be who he is in the middle of the week. It would be my conviction that he's coming with a peace treaty. He comes with a peace treaty because of all the chaos that is going to be around Israel during this season prior to his coming into the play and bringing a treaty. I was quite intrigued if we read in Revelation chapter uh, Revelation chapter 11 uh, again it, it describes quite nicely the way that he operates uh, verse 23 of Revelation 11 of Daniel 11 Daniel 11 he said like this uh, and after the league is made with him so the league is this treaty, a treaty, it's a deal he makes a deal is made with him he shall act deceitfully for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people and he shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province and he shall do what his fathers have not done nor his forefathers he shall disperse among them the plunder and spoil and riches and he shall devise his plans against the stronghold, but only for a time. And so we're just seeing a picture of a fellow who's very cunning, very deceitful. He makes a, a treaty. 
he is working into this region and that's why i i think as far as israel this is not going to be a too difficult time for them they're actually going to rebuild the temple in here because part of this treaty must be to rebuild the temple because it's in the temple when the sacrifices are being made that he will he will cancel the sacrifices and set himself up as god in the temple we will read that so he's doing something his forefathers couldn't do well no one's been able to get this treaty done and get a temple agreement on the temple mount he's going to do that and they will build a temple there after in, in this period of time so he's cunning he's after his own self he's looking after himself he's spoiling things and so many of the deceitful leaders of the world today that's all they care about it's all for self, self, and take, you know, and greed and corruption, all this stuff. It's just normal for the world today. But this guy is going to be the master of them all, and he will begin his work in through here. But in the middle of the week, he's going to uh, betray his treaty. He's going to set up himself in the temple as God, and he's going to demand the people worship him. We will read all about these things in Revelation. But I'm just wanting to just bring this picture in that this is the time. Remember, he is the Antichrist. He's not a nice man who just doesn't go to church. He is the Antichrist, which means he is against Christ. And so in the first few years, of course, there will be, you know, possibly some anti-christian elements going on which is going on today really you can see it building and building and building but under his leadership uh, there will be more anti-christian kind of tendencies however it would be my conviction that it's not until he is declared as the antichrist because when we look at revelation we're going to see that the false prophet is with him the false prophet and the antichrist work together and co coerce together to create the government and the world system that will be in at that time. We will see this. So it's at this period here that the antichrist activities will be taking place that will be against Christ. He will have manifested himself. Everyone will know this game and he will be against Christ and he will be demanding people worship him and that will be the great gulf between believers and unbelievers in, and that will be uh, concluded in the mark of the beast which we all understand and so he is in this period when we get to Revelation we'll start overlaying some of these things here but this for me is the period we are currently in this period now Jesus talked about wars and rumors of wars and so forth. But you remember we talked about the Ezekiel 36 through to 38. That's the war that is going to preempt this. Now, I was just thinking, it, we have to say, I mean, we've had lots of wars, and the Ukraine war is with us now. And I also wouldn't be at all surprised if there isn't something in Taiwan with the Chinese there. Mm -hmm. They're getting a bit feisty, you know. So there will be wars in the world and wars and rumors of wars. But those are not the wars that, that affect this picture. There will always be this carry on in the world. This Ezekiel war is the one that is against Israel and God is doing it for a specific purpose. We read that last week. He's doing it because he wants to uh, bring judgment upon those who have betrayed him but more importantly, he wants to show Israel that he is their God. We are going to understand that, that while God is angry with Israel, and he is because of their betrayal of him, he loves them. And he will continue to the very end to try and get their attention that they would understand that Jesus is the Messiah and he is their God. You know, I've been quick recently just with the simple knowledge of this, that if the God we worship is the living God, we will also know that Jesus is the Son of God. You cannot separate the God of creation from Jesus. 
And so if we don't believe in Jesus, it's very clear we don't believe in God, or not the living God. And so it's important for Israel to understand that if they are truly going to become the children of God, they're going to need to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And so this journey, God is continuing to have with them as much, of course, as he is for the entire world, that all the people would know that Jesus is truly the Messiah. But you can't have Jesus without God, and you can't have God without Jesus. They are synonymous. And so when we say we don't believe in Jesus, well, we have to say we don't believe in God either. Certainly not the living God. And so those things are very important. God is going to not only in this situation make himself known to his people, and we read last week that they will know that he is their God. When I do this for them, they will know. And But later on through here, there is also another period of distinct ministry to Israel through the two witnesses that they again might know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so every opportunity is given to the Israeli people to know that the Messiah is Jesus and their father has sent the Messiah already. They need to believe in him and be saved. So out of this chaos that's down here, then this treaty will come. There were some other issues around this, but you can see that in the world today, Chaos is building everywhere, and the Middle East, you know, has got its own little um, melting pot, melting pot of, <laughs> of trouble happening. It's brewing and brewing and brewing all the time, and anything could happen at any time. But this will be a company of people coming down from the north, and they're gathering a confederate of nations around about, and they will go against Israel. God is going to cause them to do it, then he's going to destroy them to show his people that he is their deliverer and he is their God. So that is going to happen. When we see what's happening in the Ukraine right now, it makes it very easy for us to understand that wars can happen very quickly. These are, uh, these are wake-up calls for us and for me. puts a very clear stake in the ground. But that's going to happen against Israel, not against Taiwan, not against Ukraine. This is an Israel thing. That's why this is the one the Bible talks about. So, the Antichrist is in the middle here, we'll talk more about that. But the other thing that I wanted to show, and I was starting last week, is that there are other numbers in this Daniel. Daniel gives us uh, four numbers. We've got the 1260, which is the three and a half years. We've got 1290. We've got 1335. And these are all found in Daniel toward the end. And then we've got a 2,300, 2,300, 2,300. And so I've been trying to, you know, how do these numbers fit into the picture? Again, and I insisted, as I did last week, this is just my idea, but the numbers have to fit somewhere. You can't just say, well, here's a whole lot of numbers. I wonder, you know, it's interesting. They must fit somewhere. So here's how I fitted them together. To me, I think it makes sense, but could be completely wrong. 1260 is to, is, is, comes to the end of the age. The church is going out at this point here. But another 30 days, I'm considering that the wrath of God comes after the church has gone out, obviously. And there could be 30 days of wrath in here where God comes in his anger to make vengeance. It's important to understand the difference between tribulation, which is God squeezing everything that people would believe, to wrath, which is God's anger. Nobody gets saved beyond this point. Noah, Noah's ark, God shut the boat, it's all over. You can't get saved. And the whole idea that people can get saved after the church has gone out really makes no sense whatsoever. Because the whole point of the church going out is that God can bring his wrath into the earth and destroy all those who have willingly and knowingly been against him and have no interest in him. So that's the end of that. 1335, I wondered whether, because after the wrath, obviously the Lord Jesus is coming back, 
to set up his kingdom and we will be coming to set up the kingdom in the earth. So I wonder whether this another uh, 1335, that's, yeah, another 45 days in here just to tidy things up and get it ready for us to come back. And the Lord's got a few angels get, get all that done pretty quickly. But I just wondered, if, 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 if you read those passages, and they're at the end of Daniel 11 and 12, you'll see those numbers are there. And for me, without taking too much time, it kind of indicates that everything is bringing this conclusion. And if we wait till this very end, then we are blessed in that. So that could be, could be. 2,300, if we read that, I think is from the establishing of the new temple to the end. So 2,300 days. So if that's 2,300 days, I think we worked at that was 220 days in here to rebuild the temple and get it ready after the Antichrist Treaty has been made. So those are just thoughts about those numbers. You can think about it for yourselves, but I think it's important for us to know what, you know, to have, to have an idea. We can't just have numbers and they just float around. So 220 days, rebuild the temple, and then there's 2,300 days of the temple in existence. But of course, half of that will be spent under the abomination of desolation. 1260, the time of the great tribulation, where the Antichrist and the Lord are ministering into the earth. 1290 days, of the wrath of God for 30 days, just basically smashing everything. And then another 45 days beyond there until the Lord and us come back to set up the kingdom in the earth. Just thoughts, but it, it's a time frame that has some sense to it because it all has to happen. The, 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 the time has to end, wrath has to come, and we have to come back. So I'm just putting those numbers on a page to give us some thoughts. All right, we are now going to go to the book of Revelation. And that's where we really want to be. So the book of Revelation obviously is the revelation of John to give us understanding of the sort of things that are going to happen in the last days. This is a picture of the last days. It is the last days. There are no other days and it will not change. <coughs> Revelation is fixed. It is what it is. And it cannot be changed because it's the picture of what happened. And, and John is just giving us the picture of things we saw happen. So let's begin to read in the book of Revelation and I'm going to start in Revelation chapter 5. Why am I starting in Revelation chapter 5? Because I think the first four, obviously, are the, are the letters to the churches, which we understand. And that is a precursor to warn the churches of, that, of the days which are to come. That's, that's the point of the book of the letters to the churches, warning of the days that are to come and to be prepared for the days that are to come and to make adjustments. If you have to make adjustments, then make adjustments. Now is the time to do it, not later. And so that's for uh, one, two, three, four is a picture of heaven, uh, the heavenly throne room, uh, which is perfect. And then in five, we begin the understanding of God's uh, outworking of his purposes into the earth over the last days. So starting in Revelation chapter 5 we see a picture of the seals or a scroll which God has on which there are seven <coughs> seals. We'll look through this we'll see there are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, there are seven uh, bowls and so on as God is outworking his tribulation, great tribulation, and then wrath into the earth. The other thing that's very important to understand about all these things is this is God doing it. It's not the devil. The devil will have his part when the Antichrist comes in. He will have his ministry to play, which will be against the church. But uh, God is working to bring shaking into the whole earth. 
because his heart is that people will know that only he uh, will endure forever. So God's heart is continuing continually that all people are saved. And so he's doing everything he can to shake the earth and to shake everything that can be shaken so that only that which cannot be shaken will remain. And so it is important to know that it is God who's doing these things. It's not man, it's not the devil, it is God. He is shaking. So just reading, and I saw uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, and I saw at the right hand of whom he sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then the issue was who's going to open the seal. Verse 4, and so I wept because there was no one found worthy to open the seals or to, or to look at it. Verse 5, one of the elders came to do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Verse 6, and I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll into the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And so it goes on, and it's worthy as he that is willing. He was able to undo the, the scrolls and so forth. So the picture that I'm needing you to catch here, because it's important later, is this throne room of God. So you've got the four living creatures, You've got the 24 elders, and you've got in the midst of the throne is the Lamb, and obviously God is in the midst of the throne. So this is the picture of the throne of God. Beautiful picture you will, um, you will obviously recognize. Right. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> then, then I want to go to verse 6, uh, chapter 6, because now the seals are being opened. Revelation 6, the seals are being opened. Now when I heard the Lamb open one of the when I, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, I love that, whenever God speaks of thunder and lightning and earthquakes, <laughs> You know, man blows a little trumpet when God blows his trumpet something really happens so I quite enjoyed that uh, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder come and see and I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it with a bow had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering to conquer and so again there's much thought around who this white horse but here's the first thing to understand he who spoke was one of the living creatures and he said, come and look. And he looked and there was a white horse. And many wonder about the white horse and there's many uh, thoughts about who the white horse is. But for me, I think the white horse is very clear. The white horse is deception, deception. It's a counterfeit, deception. It's not the white horse of Jesus. That comes in Revelation 19. So everything the devil does is a counterfeit of God, you know, and people get deceived because, oh, it looks like God, but actually it isn't, but it just looks like God. And when Jesus comes, he's going to have many crowns, not one, and he's going to have a sword, not a bow and arrow, you know. So this is, the sp I, I would say this is the spirit of the Antichrist, not the Antichrist himself, but it's the carrying the spirit of deception into the world. Now when Jesus spoke to us in Matthew 24, we know the first thing he said was, beware, many will come in my name, don't be deceived. And so the first part of the devil or the first part, not the devil, God's opening in the world is deception. Why is he doing that? It's so, well, what do you believe? Because Paul teaches us that at the end days people will not have a heart for the truth but they'll go after people that are teaching things that tickles their ears. And so the Lord is saying, well, okay, here you go. Have whatever you want. But if you want me, then I 
and the way, and your heart will know what is deceiving and what isn't deceiving. Again, I, I'm quite clear in my heart, as much as some people don't agree with me, that you can only be deceived if you're available to be deceived. It's like temptation. Temptation actually is not on the outside, it's on the inside. You are tempted because you are tempted. Temptation is everywhere, but you are tempted because you are tempted. Now, deception is everywhere, but you are deceived because you are available to be deceived. God has given us his Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and to keep us from, from evil and to keep us from deception. But if we're available to be deceived, then we will always be deceived and will follow after all kinds of things which sort of suit our belief system rather than follow after the truth of God. So deception gives people the opportunity to believe what's right or to believe what's wrong. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen the world with more deception in it than it has today. And I'm talking not only uh, politically, emotionally, spiritually, the whole gamut, deception, corruption, deceit, manipulation, the whole world is just one deceived, manipulated population. And so for me, this is this horse who has been in the world for some time. Some people say, well, it had, these things haven't come yet, they'll come here. I think this white horse has been galloping around for some time now and is slowly deceiving and slowly heating up the water and just allowing people to believe whatever lie they want to and there is many for them to choose from. So the white horse for me is deception. It is uh, counterfeiting God and his word. And I have heard things recently that just makes my hair stand on end that, that God's people are saying, which has no one spectrum of truth to it, but they're saying it boldly as if it's absolute truth and people are believing it as if it's absolute truth because it suits their desire. It doesn't suit their spirit, the spirit of God, but it suits their spirit because they they want to follow after their own will, and there is plenty of option for these things to be there. So for me, the white horse is deception. The second horse is verse three. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say. So remember, it's a living creature is saying it. I'm pointing that out for a, for an important reason. He opened the second seal, and I heard the second living creature say, Come and see, and a fiery red horse went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and it was given to him a great sword. So we now have a red horse, and, and I think, rightly so, we often talk about this as war. And the reason I say that is, because he got, people should kill one another. So it's um, uh, take peace from the earth, and certainly there is no peace in the earth today, but this specifically speaks to me about people killing one another, which speaks of war, and we're seeing that before our very eyes today, of course. So war and killing, people killing people and that is very evident today. It would be my conviction, and this is what really woke me up to want to research this, that this horse has been released in recent days. I think the Ukraine situation for me just really put a stake in the ground. I mean, there are wars all over the place. There are, you know, and people have been killed all over the place. But because of the the area that this is in, unexpected among supposedly civilized nations, it just shows you that it's more than just a person that's driving this. And that's something else that we need to understand in all this. Remember, there, there are spirits involved in all these activities that are going on. But the Lord has brought war into the world so that the people can see how 
easily man can turn against man and just kill me. I find that incredible, but this is the heart and state of man. And so, in my view, deception is released. War is released. Well, not here, because we're waiting for this fellow. So, war is released. And then, when we go to the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a black horse. A black horse. So what's about this black horse? And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. A pair of scales. Now, for some reason, most people don't say what I'm going to say about this. But scales always speak of justice. That's the whole deal of scales. And so when this fellow is coming, this is, it's, it's a picture of a world that is no justice. It's an unjust world. And you will find always when, when God is not present in any community or society, there is no justice. We can read that. In all ungodly environments, you'll see, and God saw it, and there was no justice. In other words, people are victimized, uh, this. We, we live in a world today where the vulnerable are becoming more vulnerable there is no mercy, there is no caring for people governments are corrupting there's no justice uh, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, there is no justice we live in an unjust world and uh, I think that these things are just going to get worse and worse as these days go on as injustice becomes more manifest. Now, when Jesus talked, he talked about, and let's just read this first part of Matthew 24, where we can see this in his uh, dissertation. Matthew 24, we all know it, but verse 4, take, take heed that no one deceives you, Jesus said. Matthew 24, verse 4. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and deceive many. So this is deception for me. Verse 6, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Do not be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So wars and rumors of wars, this horse, and I think he has been, he's been released in a more manifest way in recent times, I'm thinking. See that you're not troubled, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes. You know, it's interesting that out of this war, the next bit of news is famine famines because the food chains have all been messed around. They're predicting a massive famine, food shortages, the whole gamut of issues around social problems because of war. So it all mixes in with what Jesus is talking to us about. There'll be earthquakes in various places. These things, of course, are going on all the time and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. So the black horse injustice there is no justice. And I, again, I don't know about you, I've said many times, I, my heart breaks when I watch the news and I see, see the injustices of the world today, the, the attitudes of the world governments toward their people. You know, the poor people just get absolutely vanished, the abuse and all these things. There is no justice. Nobody can get up in the morning and say, we're living in a fair world and I will be justly treated. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And so this kind of activity, in my view, is already going on and will progressively get worse. The white horse, the red horse, and the black horse, in my view, they're already in the world and they are operating. But listen to the second part of Revelation chapter the second part of this black horse because this is something that I've never seen before and I want to bring it to you and it excites me immensely so let me read verse 5 again and he opened up the third seal and I heard the third living creature say come and see so I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat it had a pair of scales in his hand 
that's the end of that piece of dialogue. Verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. So this is a different voice. I heard another voice from out of the midst of the living creatures. Who is that voice? It's God. It's the Lord speaking to his people. And I'll tell you what he's saying to them. And I heard a voice out of the midst of the four living creatures saying a quarter a week for a denarius and three weeks quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. And so when I read this, I, I, for some reason I immediately knew that the Lord was speaking to his people and he was telling them, I'm going to look after you, don't worry. So many interpret this as famine and so forth and don't touch the oil and the wine, many say. It's because the rich people need to have oil and wine. I said, well, for kind of, that's nothing to do with the rich people. It's to do with God ministering into the world. This is what this is all about. And he's telling us at this point, up to this third, up to this third seal, don't worry about it. I've got your back. You don't have to worry. Don't harm the oil and the wine. If you, that's us. We are the anointed of God. Don't touch the oil and the wine and this voice came from not from one of the living creatures mm. it came from the midst that's what I think most people don't seem to see this is another voice it's not one of these voices it's coming from here and it's the Lord speaking to his church saying don't worry I will I'll look after you during this period of time and so I think that's a very important message for us because Building into this period, coming up to this period, where there will be deception, there will be war, and there will be injustice, the Lord is saying, don't you worry, because I'm going to look after you. I think that's a very important message. That's why I'm saying to the church today, be at peace. Be at peace. We are safe through this period of time. This, the, 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 the beginning of the peace treaty has not come yet. We're still out in this period. We're still a, a little way away from trouble. Just be at peace. Live your life. Glorify God. Preach the gospel. Go for it. This is the time. We're safe. We're safe. Just go for it. And I think that's a very good message because many Christians are worried and fearful. Don't be fearful. Through this period, we can trust God. He is with us and he will take care of us. I think that's a very, very good message for us. Why don't we just take a five minute break and then we'll start working through these other ones. Praise the Lord.